Welcome to the Filmlinks Podcast. A clay-based podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 145, History According to Harryhausen. That's right. Today we're going to be talking about the one, the only Ray Harryhausen, master of claymation and progenitor of a lot of uh, composite-based live uh, photorealistic looking CGI effects in Hollywood history and a guy who's inspired a lot, a lot of filmmakers. Um, so before we talk about his movies today, let's talk about the guy himself because he had a fascinating career. He was actually born in Los Angeles in 1920. He's very much is a Hollywood brat. Um, after seeing King Kong in 1933, Harryhausen began experimenting with his own animated shorts and models. A friend arranged for him to meet Willis O'Brien, who was the animator on King Kong, uh, in person, and O'Brien started mentoring and advising him while he was still in high school. On O'Brien's advice, he started taking night classes in art direction, photography, and editing at the New Cinematic Art School at USC. During this time, he became friends with Ray Bradbury and Forrest J. Ackerman, other future sci-fi luminaries. Studied, he studied art and anatomy at Los Angeles City College, and he got his first animation gig working on the Puppetoon shorts, of which art I've never heard. Art and anatomy heard. sounds so perfect for what he ended up doing. It's exactly perfect, yeah. Yeah, I know anatomy's huge with a lot of artists. A lot of artists will study anatomy extensively because the human form is weird and it helps <laughs> to know it uh, when you're doing it. And Especially as we talked about- when you're about trying on, to make things act that way. Yeah, look alive, right? A lot of those little tricks to looking alive. I mean, we talked about the Willis O'Brien short during a bonus podcast one time where the dinosaur animations looked like they were breathing yeah. accurately. And so it's all- it's all very intense, but very impressive. Um, during World War II, Ray Harryhausen actually served in the Signal Corps like many other filmmakers, even though he hadn't made his big break yet. But he served under Frank Capra as a loader, clapper, gopher, and camera assist, and I can only assume learned quite a bit about making movies during that period of time. After the war, he was hired on his first major job, Mighty Joe Young, which is one of the movies we will be talking about today. His first film where he was in full control was The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms from 1953. The studio found out that Harryhausen's friend Bradbury had actually written a story by the same name. So instead of instigating a legal suit, they just paid Bradbury for the rights to the name, even though they weren't the same story. Um, and then this Bradbury is, released it under a different name later. Yeah, which is, is really funny. Um, this is the first time he used Dynamation, which is his animation process by which the live action footage was split into multiple layers and the animated figures themselves were inserted between them to create an immersed composite, which is very similar to how a lot of modern composite-based uh, photorealistic C uh, graphics work. Oh, yeah. uh, to break that down, when I say composite... I mean, they're taking multiple elements that were shot independently or created on a computer independently, and then you're putting them together into one image. And then when I say photorealistic, that just means that the intent is to look like everything is at least immersed in a photorealistic world. And so that's even important though, because technically this is the same type of techniques that Disney was using and and. Mm -hmm like drawn animation where you are it's it's much more literal in that sense because you're drawing a background and then you have a different plate and then you have all your uh the different frames of your character moving on it which is why in certain uh of the older disney films um that have or haven't been restored um you can tell which objects in the scene are going to move because they look a little bit different from the background. Oh, yeah. And you kind of yeah. get the same effect here, except instead of having different sheets of paper that you're laying on top of each other, you're actually filming different elements and cutting them out from the background and then putting them on a different background that you filmed at a different time. And then sometimes that's, you know, five layers deep of things that you're putting on there. And that's technically still how we do visual effects. Um, yes. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh it, it's a lot of what Harry Housen's history 
uh, builds up to, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today isn't necessarily a history of animation, even though he's known for claymation and animation, but it's more of a history of VFX right? and kind of building up the CGI and computer integrated graphics into this photorealistic world. So we're less talking about the history of Pixar today, even though a lot of the animation goes into that and a lot of Pixar has references to Harryhausen and more of the history of like Marvel <laughs> and yeah. how something like that or Lord of the Rings or how something like that could come to be. Well, technically, um, the history of Pixar and ILM are related, so it's... Yes, But that's a story true. for another also time. True. We'll probably yeah, touch I on it today. we've already talked about it, uh, yeah. but yeah, we'll touch on it today as well. But back to Dynamation. Um, it was... One, a very important step in the integration of graphics, which at that point had been stuff uh, like essentially superimposition and uh, rear projection. But now with this, you were able to create a much more intricate and much more integrated image, but it did require very intricate lighting techniques um, to make it happen. You had to light your models in a way similar to how the scene was shot or vice versa. And it made the already painstaking claymation process even more painstaking and i have some notes in here later on where we'll talk about how long some of these sequences took to make it's a while yeah. it's a long time and sometimes it's tempting to look at harryhausen's uh catalog of work and wonder why he didn't make more well there's a reason it took so long to make each of these movies um but he Which, had to redevelop in context yeah. means that the amount of films that he made is a lot because it's he, really I mean, impressive some of Honestly. the, I mean, and some of these individual projects have so many sequences in them. Um, yeah. Oh, it's like just the ones intense. that we're going to talk about today. There's just so much that goes into it. Yeah, it's 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 a lot. Uh, he had to redevelop the lighting techniques again for this process on the seventh voyage of Sinbad. Again, another movie we'll be talking about today to accommodate the color and the widescreen because obviously it has to do with the framing and the lighting so now you have to properly light colored models instead of just lighting black and white models or models that were being shot in black and white so a much more intricate process and he started calling it and branding it with the help of his agent dinorama um while he was never credited as a director he was involved in nearly as much of the creative process from start to finish on his films as other auteurs of the era so very much the way we're talking about these films as ray harry Harryhausen films t today these films were made as ray harry Harryhausen films yeah um, it's funny to see so. like his name show up more and more frequently throughout the credit sequences when you watch these movies <laughs> he was the selling point which is crazy yeah. because that doesn't happen a lot for a vfx guy i can't think of another one he's actually. technically below the line and maybe that's something we should bring up because i don't think we've brought it up in a while but you know you have your you have the the people involved in a production who are considered above the line are the people whose names you would recognize the director uh, you know, the Christopher Nolans, the Hitchcocks, the Andersons, um, you have the actors, uh, obviously, like these are the people who are bringing face recognition, sometimes the producers um, even. But then you have like the people that you don't stay through the credits unless you're waiting to the end of a Marvel movie um, who are below the line, who are doing all the lighting and the set deck and the costuming and stuff like that. And so for someone who's technically below the line who's doing the visual effects which are super cool um but still like we don't we don't <laughs> raise the uh, rotoscopers of the day into the front front titles um but he like became the selling point which is kind of cool yeah yeah and he did eventually get essentially um he he got credited as a producer on many of his films so that he was getting profit sharing and mm -hmm. you know bigger payout in the later part of the career but it, of his career but it definitely did not start that way harryhausen worked frequently with his family in fact his father made the machine armatures that supported the models which were often cut out well always cut out in the final version of the composite and his mother worked on the costuming for many of his models although a lot of his models do appear buck naked so she didn't have <laughs> as much work um during the 50s, he partnered frequently with producer Charles H. Schneer 
um, who worked at the B Picture Unit of Columbia and released uh, multiple box office hit monster movies during that era. That's kind of when he really started to make a name for himself. Harryhausen's films lost popularity a bit in the 60s as the counterculture boomers, dang boomers, uh, lost interest in his ancient fantasies and became more interested in new agey stuff. I did have um, the thought that we should definitely do a sword and sandal episode at some point. Oh, probably. There's there's some really good sword and sandal films out there, um, and some interesting TV series as well. <laughs> He was hired by Hammer Films, another famous B-movie picture unit, to animate the dinosaurs for one million years B.C. And in 1969, he made The Valley of Guanji, a personal project for him as it was storyboarded by his late mentor, who never had a chance to complete the project. Uh, he worked on two more Sinbad films during the 70s, which were both box office successes and garnered him enough industry credit to work on the very big budget MGM title Clash of the Titans, 1981. Significant for him, especially because it had some really big acting names in it, as well as hit very a very high budget for animation. There was a planned sequel called Force of the Trojans, uh, which was scrapped after ILM and other CGI, CGI companies of the era eclipsed his style of VFX at the box office. Um, and his stuff started to look a bit antiquated and antiquated for the time. He had quite a few cameos, though, throughout the 80s and into the 20 knots, including Spies Like Us from 1985, Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, really? Beverly Hills Cop 2, actually, I think, from 1994. Okay. Uh, Mighty Joe Young from 1998. Uh, Monsters, Inc. from 2001, which isn't, a direct cameo instead a restaurant is named harry house um or harry house harry housens harry housens yeah uh, in the in the movie which makes sense it's clay animated monsters that's a harry housen thing and then finally elf from 2003 where he voiced the polar bear cub who says bye buddy that's at the awesome. start of the movie the uh stop in motion 2000 polar bear club cub right in 2009, he released a self-colored versions of some of his movies, including 20 Million Miles to Earth, Earth versus the Flying Saucers, and It Came from Beneath the Sea. That and just screams now, retirement activities. It's like, it let really me just does. hand color some of my old movies because I'm so It bored. really does, yeah. But uh, the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation still exists to this day, and it was a nonprofit that he and his wife set up that works to preserve both his own work and promote the art of stop motion uh, worldwide. So they they work a lot with that, and I've been to their website. It's quite nice. Um, I do recommend checking it out. It seems like they have some exhibits in places that are worth checking out as well. But that is kind of a brief, a very brief summary of the man's works. Um Let's talk about the movies that we'll be using to examine his career a little further today, Jonathan. Yeah, so starting off with Mighty Joe Young from 1949, which seems like a natural place to start, starring Terry Moore, Ben Johnson, Robert Armstrong, and Joseph Young, directed by Ernest B. Shodshak, screenplay by Ruth Rose, story by Marion C. Cooper, who you might remember from our King Kong episode, uh... That dude really loved apes. Um, cinematography by J. Roy Hunt. Uh, then we'll be following that with The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad from 1958, based on the story Sinbad the Sailor from the 1001 Nights, uh, or the Arabian Nights, or however you know it, uh, starring Kerwin Matthews, Torin Thatcher, and Catherine Grant, directed by Nathan H. Juran, screenplay by Kenneth Kolb, and cinematography by Wilkie Cooper. And then the classic Jason and the Argonauts from 1963, based on the mythical Greek tale of Jason and the Golden Fleece, starring Todd Armstrong, Nancy Kovac, Honor Blackman, and Gary Raymond, directed by Don Chaffee, screenplay by Beverly Cross and Jan Reed, and cinematography again by Wilkie Cooper. And finally, uh, Clash of the Titans from 1981, very loosely based on the Greek myth of Perseus, starring Harry Hamlin, Lawrence Olivier, Judy Bo Bowker, uh, Maggie Smith, Burgess Meredith, and Ursula Andress, directed by Desmond Davis, written by Beverly Cross, and cinematography by Ted Moore. Some good stuff. 
Yeah, yeah, it is quite. It all. I had so much fun watching all these movies for this one, and I will probably go back and watch all the rest of the Harryhausen films at some point. Um, I had a very busy month at work, and I, last I did not have time for to watch all of them. But they're so much fun, even even when they're nonsensical, they're fun. So let's jump they're into very, the first one. A lot of these are very silly. They yes, ironically, get sillier with time, which is kind of funny. Yeah, it's it's interesting. We'll talk about that because there is something to say about where the focus is on these movies. Yeah. It's something we've talked about before in the podcast where you kind of pick, like like it's hard to, for a movie to truly be an all-rounder. You kind of pick which areas you want to specialize in. You know, sometimes you specialize in story. Sometimes you specialize in VFX. And the focus, it drifts in some of these movies. <laughs> so we'll see. But alas, we're starting with Mighty Joe Young from 1949. So Jason, take it away. Mighty Joe Young from 1949. Deep in the Tanganyika territory of Africa, a precocious eight-year-old Jill Young lives on a ranch with her father. She makes a trade with some travelers for their cargo, a baby gorilla. Twelve years later, Max O'Hara, a club promoter, and Greg, a roper from Oklahoma, encounter Jill and the now 12-foot-tall gorilla, Joe Young. In search of an attraction for his new club, O'Hara recruits Jill and Joe to return to the big city with him. And surely nothing can go wrong when a giant gorilla goes to Hollywood. All right, Jonathan. So this is the first major project that Ray Harryhausen was uh, hired on, but it's not one where he was the lead VFX person. Right. This is actually one where he was able to work with his longtime mentor, Willis O'Brien. Not for the first time. They actually worked on a very famous uh, dinosaur documentary thing before this, I believe. But um, this is this is the first time where they worked together on a feature-length film. Willis O'Brien was the guy who was in charge of VFX, but he spent most of his time actually working on figuring out the technical setups of the film Remember, this is pre-Dynimation, so they're still trying to figure out how to composite all of this footage together, and this yeah. is a very complicated VFX composited movie. They I was did actually some kind of blown really away cool stuff. By the time I got to the end of it. Um, but it ended up that Harry Hausen was left in charge of almost all of the animation. He was helped out by a couple of other animators, Pete Peterson, excellent name, and Marcel, Del- Marcel Delgado, who... Uh, did a couple sequences each, but Harryhausen did the bulk of the animation itself while Willis O'Brien focused on figuring out the technical aspects. So this was a great chance for Harryhausen just to get in and like just animate like crazy yeah. and learn a lot about integrating this film process even more from O'Brien. And wow, 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 some of the VFX compositing, Jonathan, is truly impressive. Like it shows that, that you're what that they're uh, they're doing this composite, right? You've got the lion let's take let's take an example sequence right there's an early sequence early on in the movie where um mighty joe young this giant 12 foot ape is interacting with a bunch of uh ropers and wranglers from america who are out here looking for their next big um can we just throw out like right before we get into the vfx like how much this is like marion c cooper doing a redo of king kong oh it (laughs) is because he's like percent Mary C. Cooper, for some reason, is obsessed with apes, and he has this idea of, like, this 12-foot ape, and so they make King Kong. But King Kong is super sensational, and I guess he really just wanted a super heartfelt tale about a 12-foot ape, not a 50-foot ape. And yeah. uh, so he's like, we're just going to do it again, and we're going to make it... Do it again. We're going to get all the same people. It's all the same people. Some of the actors are literally in both movies. Again, they have Willis O'Brien on to do the visual effects. Uh, but he's like, we just need to tone it down and make it a little more fun, guys. Uh, and so it's like literally instead of kind of we stumble across the island and we find this thing and then we decide to make profit from him. They're like literally going to Africa to find something sensational to uh, profit off of and uh, it ends up just being a giant ape again yeah but slightly less big ape um, right. a more reasonable is, size big ape yeah more reasonable a more manageable sized ape uh, the economy Kong uh, so Mighty Joe Young is to take an example of a very inter- and in more intricate uh, composite scene Mighty Joe Young is being uh, winds up uh, stumbling upon this group of hunters that have captured a bunch of lions. 
And Mighty Joe Young is then uh, gets into a tussle with these hunters who try to in turn wrangle him. Um, but during this altercation, he ends up, or actually, I think at the very start of it, he's uh, messing with a lion that's already in like a yeah. captured like lion wagon, like think like a circus wagon. You'd see a lion in. Um, which is not ethical or humane, but like you, you know the image I'm talking of. If you've no seen, one like, cared old... about the humane treatment of lions in this no. movie. Let's just no. point: lions were harmed in the making of this. Film. I think lions were definitely harmed in the making of this movie. It's not good. I think they dropped the lion from like they a twelve foot height at a certain from the point. ceiling to crash on yeah. the table. Yeah, <laughs> he's the poor lion looks so spooked after. He's like, "What the heck just happened?" Yeah. Um. But yeah, they. Uh, so you have a live action shot of Africa. You have the claymated Mighty Joe Young. You have a wagon uh, that he's interacting with. And then you have inside the wagon, clearly it's very obviously composited, but the seams don't really show, a composited image of a lion in a cage that's composited into this wagon. That's the most straightforward shot in this whole thing because the wagon is a square, so it's got very clean lines, and you just cut out the footage of the lion and put it inside the, the little rectangle. Yeah, yeah, and they, um, uh, Mighty Joe Young is like knocking the wagon around, and obviously they and they animate or move the composited footage to move in time with the the rocking of the wagon. But that's just like a sample. There's another scene later on in the movie where Mighty Joe Young, as it was bound to go, uh, it was bound to go bananas. Some might oh, say. Oh gosh. Uh, and the nightclub is. Goes crazy. There's lions everywhere. They're attacking Mighty Joe Young. Mighty Joe Young is attacking the lions in turn. Sometimes the lion he picks up a lion and the lion becomes claymated in the next shot as he's holding. Oh, it. Oh, they do that with people to too. Being, they do that yes. through through to Clash of the Titans. Like this, mm-hmm. that's a real. It actually works out really well sometimes. Where in instead of trying to match up exactly the ape holding onto something, as soon as he picks it up, it becomes animated as well. And rather smoothly, too. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, they found all these interesting ways to integrate shots of people running away from this club, sometimes for a comically long time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, there's one shot uh, where uh, Mighty Joe Young lands on top of this walkway, this, like, uh, bamboo walkway that's clear. And they oh, essentially yeah. use the walkway as a frame for people to be running out of the building panicked. So there's a composite images within the walkway of people running away and it's meant to all fit together and it does pretty well. And while mighty Joe young is doing his thing, battling lions on top of the walkway, it's an excellent shot, but man, there are so many people (laughs) on this walkway. That footage just goes and goes and goes. It's, it's pretty funny, but they do that that scene of destroying the, yeah, the scene of destroying the nightclub is really impressive because of a, how many shots there are. So like, they're not cheaping out on, we're going to show like a shot of yeah. him destroying it. And then we're just going to cut away and show like a bunch of reaction shots. But, you know, and, and this is something I was thinking of too, is like in these movies, and this is again, what you were saying in terms of what the focus of the movie is. And this film is a little different from some of the other ones. Cause this is a little more like story oriented. It's not necessarily, you know, come see a bunch of crazy monsters. Um, it's again, it's King Kong part two, it's beauty and the beast, but <clears throat> Um, uh, oh gosh, where was I going with that? Um, uh, this, the focus here is on, we came to see the ape do stuff, right? We came to see these integrated shots. We came to see the ape. Right. Uh, yeah. What I was saying is this. this is not hide the monster. This is not jaws. This is show off the monster. Yeah. This is the host. Right. Yeah. This <laughs> is, this is, I mean, that's, that's the idea behind the host. Yeah. This is much less dark than the host, but it's it's the same idea where it's like we want we we came to see the claymation, and to see these really really impressive integrated technologies. Now you can you can take the point of view, and I totally uh, I understand where it's coming from, even if I don't agree from a modern perspective. Where you take a look at this and you're like, that doesn't look as good as modern CGI. Well, yeah, sure, but the the while the techniques might not have the same fidelity as a high, like a supercomputer generating graphics, the skill with which they are implemented here yeah. is like top notch. It's incredible. The imagination and the uh, the 
like integration of everything is just so well done and so impressive. Like it's it's really good. And it's frankly, really, really, really good. This is kind of one of those things, and I feel like I feel like our generation feels this is there is something to be said for you know and and when i say our generation like we grew up with technology with our phones and stuff like that and we were a little bit kind of on the cusp but it's still like there's a thing where our generation has gone back to some of the physical media like vinyl has taken off again and you know like Um, I really enjoy using fountain pens or people use mechanical watches and stuff because there's something about the physical workings of stuff that's almost more mysterious than the technological workings of it. Like I understand visual effects. Maybe that's just because of what I do and I kind of am at like a very low rung of that, but I kind of understand how digital effects work. But this kind of effects is it just kind of leaves you in awe like oh my gosh, there's so many different pieces that have to be coordinated just right to make this yeah. look as cool as it is. I think I think there's definitely this thing, especially nowadays, where it feels like we're constantly in a technology race to get, you know, more resolution or a deeper range of color uh, or a more integrated smartphone camera, whatever it is, uh, where there's so much focus on what tool you have access to rather than like the mastery of the tools you have at your disposal. And I think that's what you see here. Like they don't have the fanciest thing. They are, they're doing this over a long period of time with blood, sweat and tears and talent and and just sheer skill that they've built up over years and years of doing it. And it doesn't matter what tool you're using. If you don't have the skill to back it up, it ain't going to come out super smooth. doesn't matter how fancy your graphics program is if you don't know how to use it. And I'll, I'll, I'll reverse that too to this point. It doesn't matter how rudimentary your graphics uh, program is. If you have the skill to make that thing sing, you can make it sing. Yeah. Like my little, I have like the little cheap plastic recorder <laughs> that, I, that I had in fifth grade and I don't know how to play it at all. And it sounds mm-hmm. terrible when I play it, but I'm sure a pro recordist could jam on that thing and make it sound like a million bucks. Frankly, you know, yeah, to that point, which might be a little off topic, but I didn't actually realize I thought the recorders were like basic instruments that they give you in school, but no one actually plays. And then it's a real thing. Yeah, My dad bought an album of like Haydn uh, or Handel. I think it's Handel, like literally wrote sonatas for the recorder. And when you hear that instrument being played like it is a thousand times better than hot cross buns in a fifth fifth grade classroom yeah oh 100 percent. yeah and that's i think that's where i want to one of the big takeaways that i want to focus on today is that yes this is like very rudimentary composite uh composite graphics but they're really impressive they're Mm -hmm. so well done and the i mean just the sheer understanding that you had to have of the compositing process and lighting and move movement, the fundamentals of animation to make it work on this basic of a level because you don't have a program helping you out with all of that is just crazy, crazy, yeah. crazy, 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 crazy impressive. It makes sense too, because essentially from the moment Harryhausen saw King Kong in 1933, he started practicing. Right. And he met O'Brien not that long after that when he was in high school and high took school. night That's classes nuts. at like USC. I don't know if I mentioned that in the opening bit, but he took night classes at USC at the uh, one of the um, first film programs to ever exist in yeah. the country. Yeah. Um, but but the, he, he's been practicing for years and years and years just to get to this point with this movie. The interesting thing, too, that would be something to kind of track as we go through, but probably flesh out in overall notes, is that, like, that being said with how how well you use the tools that you have. It's also kind of shaded by the larger project. And some of these, like, I feel like this project probably has the most heart behind it because again, it's, it's a tried and true story. I mean, it's very lighthearted. Um, and it's, it's a feel good movie. Uh, but some of these are just kind of there. I mean, they're B movies. And so, it's interesting to see that dynamic of like a really skilled craftsman and then kind of just 
but it's in service of something that almost otherwise without some of these levels of detail would just fall into the mystery science theater camp. Um, yeah. And so it's yeah, there's, really interesting to see that dichotomy. Yeah. And in, in here in, in Mighty Joe Young, it's interesting because the story isn't, well, it's not bad, but it's not really good, good either. <laughs> it's no, but it's, it's feel good. But it's, it's, it has exactly just enough it, heart yeah, to it. What, yeah, I think what I'm getting at is that it's definitely not the emphasis of the movie, but it is it exists in service of the tone, like you're saying, with the heart that it has, and exists in service of setting up these VFX scenes, that it's exactly what it needs to be. Yeah. And we, sometimes when we, because we, we're talking about like, you know, where you focus on when you make a movie, because you can't do everything in a movie. Uh, they're definitely focusing on the VFX here, but when you can't focus on another element, like you can't really spend that much time focusing on story in this movie, you still have to shape that smaller aspect of the movie to point towards or support. If it's a support, if it's a support strut now and not the main show, it still has to support the main show. And in Mighty Joe Young, it definitely does that. It right. definitely, it's a smaller element of the movie, but it supports the bigger elements of the movie and it's exactly what it needs to be. And when I, I think that we'll get to a point with one of these later movies, specifically Clash, where it's not that. And you kind of have, uh, you kind of have like a, a Clash <laughs> for uh, between multiple elements of the movie for what's going to take center stage and it almost feels like you're bopping between multiple movies than it is you're watching one integrated piece yeah. and that definitely hurts it. So, uh, and, and this this is a very good example of the story being exactly the size that it needs to be, exactly the amount of focus that it needs to be on it and then just supporting the, the setup that leads us to this warm, uh, fun romp that PETA would probably hate uh, <laughs> and lions definitely don't like, but it's a pretty fun movie at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I do. I like in terms of the story, there's just some story things I have to point out. And this one's actually positive because I kind of love the fact that the, the money grubbing nightclub manager like kind of becomes a good guy at the end. Like he's not just a mustache twirling antagonist he actually is is he's selfish but he's not heartless and then the real enemy ends up being drunks at a nightclub which i find kind yeah. of appropriate <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> the 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 real the real enemy at the end of the day was man's inner 12 foot ape exactly oh, it man. was beauty that slayed the beast the beast was yeah, and that yeah, this was a redemption of King Kong. The beast was not slayed, and they all lived happily ever after. They did, they did. They sent that really funny like they got their silent <laughs> film recording. The end. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh! This is that movie. That's right. We have to talk about this before it ends because this is the most random part of the movie, but it makes sense for giving it a good ending. Is the really random sequence? They've made their escape. There's the amazing chase scene. Oh yeah, uh, where Joe Young <laughs> the is on the truck, sequence. which is again another really impressive composite scene because it has him on the back of a moving truck that's being shot in live action, and he's interacting with these live action people at the same time. But at the very <laughs> end of that, they cap it off with them stopping at an orphanage fire. <laughs> Just saying it makes me laugh because it's so random. And Mighty Joe Young comes saying and saying it saves like the that's day. a noun, like an orphanage fire is like a thing. <laughs> yeah, like something you just might see by the side of the road. <laughs> an orphanage fire. Um, Roadkill, an orphanage fire. And again, very impressive compositing, especially uh, because they're not just compositing the ape, they're also compositing the people into yeah. the flaming building at the same time. And this uh, film is black and white, and they did the the red tinting specifically for that one scene. They did, yeah, yeah. It's 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 very well done. It's from a story perspective, it's just random and an excuse to make a make everybody love the ape again. Yeah, and uh, it, to to give us another fun um, composite VFX sequence. But man, oh man, did it come out of nowhere. <laughs> Absolute madness. Because they're being chased by police, and I think the police stop, and everyone just stops to help the fire, and then we can't continue with our chase. Yeah, it's the only the only resonance that I can get for it is that both uh, Joe Young 
and although I've completely forgotten her name, our female lead, who's the person who raised Joe Young. Right. Uh, I think her name was Joe. That was another thing. Was her name Joe? Oh, gosh. yes. Uh, well, they were both orphans. Oh, so Jill. That's the, Jill. Joe and that's Jill. It. Joe and Jill. I like that Joseph Young is credited too as in the opening credits. <laughs> is he credited as himself? Yeah, it just says and featuring Joseph Young. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, they ha- they were having fun with this movie. They knew. Oh, they yeah. knew what they were making and they did a good job of it. And you know what it comes back to too when we're talking about these elements of a movie is that you oftentimes have to judge a movie based on its own criteria. Right. Which, which sounds... It sounds really generous, but I promise you it's not because so many movies mistake themselves or misunderstand themselves. And when a movie kind of understands what it's trying to be and plays into those elements and tries to be the best version of that thing that it is, then it can be really, it it normally winds up being really, really good and really, really satisfying. But sometimes you get a movie pretending to be something, something else or misunderstanding its elements um, and that winds up being much more of a mess. And this is a pretty good example of a movie understanding yeah, that it can be kind of random and silly and fun. And uh, I mean, it never really loses the comedic elements of it. Maybe. I think Joe maybe, Young makes uh, faces at the police in the last scene. Yeah, he's like, he's like, uh, <laughs> he's like making faces off the back of the truck at the uh, police. It's, it's really goofy. Um, it gets, it gets a little dark, I guess, during the lion sequence. But maybe that's just because we, <laughs> we don't like to see lions view. be thrown across the room. Yeah, I think we have a different view on animal safety now in 2022 than in 1943 or whatever, or 1949. I think I think there's a bit of a different take on um, treat treatment of animals yeah. in movies. This is the post Airbud era. We we value <laughs> we value animals in films now. Oh, jeez. Um, so yeah. All right. Anything else on, uh, Joe Young? No, I think that's mighty Joe Young. So now let's get into, uh, into the histories. The seventh voyage of Sinbad from 1958. Jason, take it away. The seventh voyage of Sinbad from 1958. Sinbad and his crew rescued the magician Sokura from the giant cyclops upon the island of Colossa. The magician begs Sinbad to help him recover his lost magic lamp from the Cyclops, but Sinbad refuses. He must escort his fiancée, the Princess of Chandra, to their wedding in Baghdad, which will secure peace between the lands. Before the wedding, the magician weaves his magic and shrinks the princess, a spell for which the only antidote is on the island of Colossa. So, Sinbad gathers his crew, the shrunken princess, and the treacherous magician, and sets sail for his seventh voyage of adventure. Um, I just want to say that this movie, the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, is basically what the tagline for Raiders of the Lost Ark that says the return of the great adventure, this is what they're referencing. Like, this is basically... Yes that kind of adventure. And I know Raiders doesn't have uh, like actual monsters or mythology in it, but it well, some of the, some of the later ones actually do more than Raiders, but like, this is the kind of stuff that they were referencing and actually ended up doing better. But it also plays like an extended episode of Star Trek, um, just set in the Arabian nights era. Yes. Yeah. I also like to refer to this era of Harryhausen's work as the boat era. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because the next three movies involve people journeying on boats to they're places. Very, yeah, they're all variations on a theme. I think this one and Jason of, and the Argonauts are super similar. It's very, very, very similar in a lot of ways. Um, but you're also right in saying that this is like the section of films that like the film budget, Brat Generation, Lucas, Spielberg... Um, kind of grew up with, uh, it. and you would see that you're gonna see these make a big comeback uh, in in about two decades after uh, two to three decades after uh, these movies come out in blockbuster formats with stuff like Raiders and Star Wars that also used composited graphics, but this time mm-hmm. with computers. And ironically enough, those were kind of the things that kind of ushered claymation out as a mainstream. Um, work, although it still exists today as a um, 
more stylized genre. Yeah. Um, ironically enough, too, this is called the seventh voyage of Sinbad, but it's uh, the events are based off of the third and fifth voyages of Sinbad and not the seventh. But who's uh, counting? But who's counting? Apparently Sinbad. Uh, although <laughs> I, the other the other thing that I find funny about that is that we I can see that there's two different voyages here because there's the one where he comes back with his, his betrothed and then there's the one where he goes and um, gets the lamp back. But that also means he took a break in the middle to go on a fourth voyage. And I, <laughs> I want to know what that voyage is. I'm going to have to go f- read... 1001 nights at some point because it sounds pretty interesting uh but yeah. we will also say this is the first film to feature harry Hausen's full um dynamation label on so, in the credits i looked this up the trailer him. for this for our for our Did trailer you? episode and what the whole it look thing, like so the whole thing is um oh gosh what are their names you know our our damsel lady she does Sinbad the voiceover and princess? yeah princess Catherine grant she does the whole voiceover and she, the whole thing is just her hyping it up. She says, this is the voyage of Sinbad and and how he rescues me or whatever. And look at these monsters. I don't know how they do this. I just sit back and watch. They tell me it's called Dynamation, a new technology. <laughs> and it's like the whole thing is just her talking over it. You know, what the funny thing is, is it just sounds like a modern game trailer. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about like this is the story of this character, and we use this technology to make our game now. That's exactly exactly. No mention what of the story <laughs> is just literally how many shots of the Cyclops and stuff can we show that don't give too much away. They know exactly what they're selling, and this is this is a really good example of. Uh, and I think this is a good format for uh, for Harryhausen because the last movie we talked about, Joe Young, was an original story. This is an established one. Uh, referenced yeah. off of something else that somebody adapted from a screenplay. So you don't have to worry about the story. It's done. It's taken care of. It takes a backseat and it exists and it goes through a mythical uh, land of magic and takes you to different fight scenes and it does everything you need, need it to do. <laughs> and, which is basically what the Thousand and One Nights literally exist for, which is why they've been made since the silent films have been, they've been reimagining these stories. This is where Aladdin really comes good from. Setup. If you don't know. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about the details of the uh, claymation work because this is where we're going to start talking about the production times getting longer and longer. Um, it took 11 months to animate and composite this film altogether. And I think the shooting took one or two months. Of course. Uh, the, Jeez. The, uh, the dragon itself is three feet long. IRL. Yeah. So sometimes too, like I, I, uh, for some whatever reason, whenever I watch these claymated movies, I always think the claymation models are really small, but they're normally not. They're normally quite sizable, so you can get a lot of detail in them. But I also have to imagine that that three foot long dragon is pretty heavy and hard to move. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really probably interesting knowing for the that animation process. Right, but it also has like, especially for. A character like the dragon that has to move its head in like a serpentine way like there's so many little joints and stuff that you have to be able to for control. every frame yeah for every frame you shoot you have to move three foot a dragon but That's then crazy. you have the shot of the dragon and the cyclops fighting the cyclops is almost not quite but almost as tall as the dragon is long so yeah these are yeah, pretty big they're like, all big characters yeah, and actually, fun fact: that Cyclops is cannibalized work, and uh, Harryhausen would do this a lot, where he would basically just use his old models over and over again, mm-hmm. and just kind of like rescale them. But the Cyclops is based off of the base of the Cyclops is Emir, the monster from Twenty Million Miles to Earth, and the base of the dragon is the Redosaurus from the Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms. Okay. Um, Repurposed, and he would do this again in future ones as well. For instance, the the Cobra Woman in this um, in this movie would be used again in uh, Clash of the Titans for Medusa, and the skeletons in this movie would get used again in Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah, um, I thought that was interesting. That the the scene from Jason is so much more famous, but it's almost a, a rehash from this movie. <laughs> Yeah, and just to give you a flashback to like high school motion graphics, 
Um, the Dragon Flame is composited footage as well, and Harryhausen shot that by uh, using a flamethrower against. Uh, he shot that at night against like a completely black mm-hmm. background, yeah. and then cut that out, and then composited it with the footage itself using his Dynamation layered technique as well so he made his own particle effects he didn't just download yeah. it from the internet he went out there with a real flamethrower and did it well yeah that would go in in a stock footage pack now but uh oh 100 yeah i mean it kind of looks like that though when you're when you're watching it it looks like you know at at a theme park or something where they have or you know like the harry potter world where they have the dragons and then they literally have mm-hmm. flamethrowers in their mouths like you could yeah. t- it's like you could tell that there's this this model of a dragon and then real flames coming out oh 100% yeah but it still it gets the job done you know this winds up being a very very fun adventure and if you wanted me to recount any of the plot to you right now i probably couldn't oh, yeah. even though like i wrote the summary down for jason I, I I can't remember a lot of it. It's actually a little confusing, probably because it follows multiple chapters of the original story. Right. Um, but also but, because you know, it's so it similar to like Jason and the Argonauts, where it's they're on the boat, they go, they do one thing, and then they go back, and then they have to go back again. And so then you're thinking, okay, so I know at some point they fought skeletons. At some point there was this big two headed chicken. At some point, yeah, like <laughs> I you, don't know why they were doing all this stuff. But also you in this one, the set pieces. Yeah, and in this one, um, they have the uh, the evil magician who shrinks the princess, and they have to fix that. But also, oh, also, yeah. he's so sketchy, and they just like believe him. Like he turns the princess tiny, and then they're like, "How could this happen? Do you know how to fix it?" After they've already ticked him off enough, they're like, "Why don't you just suspect that he did it?" And on, plus and he. He yeah. could have totally fixed her without them going on this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it doesn't really make sense, but it also no, it. doesn't need to make sense. And then there's the whole you like know? side plot of the pirates trying to, to maroon them. Oh, yeah, the prisoners. Yeah. Yeah, that one, that one was a weird beat. I'm bet, I'm willing to bet that that was so, just something in the, um, in the original Sinbad story that just kind of like leaked its way through. And they were like, "Ooh, live action scenes. Let's shoot it. Let's let's take up some space." Yeah. Although I'm glad you mentioned the princess shrinking again because while we were talking about claymation, we almost forgot to mention that there's more composite uh, work done right. being done with the princess being shot small and then dynamated in so that she could come in and out of parts of the scene, um, and not just be awkwardly superimposed on top of it. And she's being carried around in in Sinbad's pants. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> I mean, where else are you going to carry your fiance, Jonathan? (laughs) She's in this little box. Oh, my gosh. This is, again, like I said, these just kind of get sillier and sillier because this one actually, Jason Jason holds it together a little bit better. But uh, this one literally just made me think of original season of Star Trek. You know, Kirk goes to this planet where all these weird things are happening and he has this like shocked expression all the time uh, while there's also this like mild love story in the background. Yep. Well, that's that's like the basic setup for a story of especially for a fantasy story. Right. And the the setup for a lot of these movies, especially this one and the next two we'll talk about is end of one quest, start of the next quest in the first act and then the second act and the third act are concluding the new quest that started. Right. So we catch we catch Sinbad at the end of this quest to go get this fiance at the start. And then when he just when he thinks he's going to get to rest, we start up the new quest immediately. We see the Cyclops. We l- see the lamp with the genie. Again, there's the genie appearing in smoke. That's more impressive composite work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we go on this new adventure. Uh, we also, I will say, the um, one of the more impressive animation scenes, and I think uh, Harryhausen mentioned that this is his favorite from this movie, is the uh, Snake Woman dance. When the Handmaiden gets turned into... That's so um, funny. Gets turned into a snake lady and does a big dance for everybody, and everyone's like, "Oh my gosh!" Yeah, that one's that one's the hardest to rewatch because you're not like the Cyclops is a monster through and through, but with the snake lady, you're being asked to believe that this human character that we've been watching turned into this snake lady, and but her face is just so play doughy that it's really hard to follow with. 
Oh yeah. 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 It definitely, it definitely like the claymation shows. Right. Right. Um, and it doesn't doesn't really hit the suspension of the leaf belief mark for us. And I think that a big part of that is just like where we're at in terms of modern media and the amount of polish we can heap onto something these days. Uh, right. But I'm just saying some of these models have a level of detail that far exceeds the snake lady in this movie. <laughs> yes, this is true. This is very true. Um, I think a lot of the focus on the snake lady went to its movement. Its movement yeah. is very impressive it's pretty smooth yeah i mean it's interesting that this is the the first big color movie that harry Hausen works on yeah right and we talked about that in the in the intro section where we talked about how he he introduced dynorama uh, as a technology so the uh level of intricacy in his work had to go up as he had the light colored images to go with everything else um but other than that, I guess the biggest thing to note is that this is kind of a big breakout into this mythological setting for Harryhausen that would become a big staple of his career oh, uh, yeah. during the second half of it. And they definitely set it up that way. Um, I don't remember exactly how this one ends, but I, but in Jason and the Argonauts and Clash of the Titans, they leave them both open-ended because they are definitely like, we can do more. <laughs> we'll do more yeah. Jason stories. We'll do more Clash of the Titans stories. And uh, I th I think they did that with this one, but I don't remember exactly how it ends. They but did. Like they, had, they had two more uh, Sinbad movies. One that's called The Golden Voyage of Sinbad and oh, yeah. another one that I don't remember the name of. Um, and then uh, they planned a sequel for Clash of the Titans called Force of, Tro of the Trojans, but it was never uh, it was never made. Right, that one was a little late. But yeah, they're, all, kind of they're all set up to be, let's just do as many of these as we can get people to come see. All right, I think that's all we have to say about this one, so let's move on. Let's go to Greece, and we'll hang out in Greece for the rest of the show. Yeah, let's go to Greece for a couple movies. Jason and the Argonauts from 1963. Set it up, Jason. And your Argonauts. Jason and the Argonauts from 1963. Peleus usurps the thrones of Thessaly in a bloody coup, killing the previous king, his daughter, and profaning the temple of Hera, winning her eternal scorn. Hera warns Peleus to beware a one-sandaled man, and little does the wicked man know, the son of the former king was whisked away to safety under the watchful eye of Hermes. Once he's fully grown, Jason returns to the land of his birth and saves Peleus from drowning in a river, losing a sandal in the process. Hoping to send this harbinger to his death, Peleus encourages Jason upon his quest for the Golden Fleece. With Hera's help, Jason gathers a crew for his ship Argo and sets off on a perilous journey of mythical proportions. All right, Jonathan, this movie was originally a box office flop. Mm -hmm. Again, part of the that weird uh, thing where the boomers did not want to watch anything set in an old antiquated setting, which is... Weird because this is also widely considered to be like the best Harryhausen movie. Uh, it's Harryhausen's favorite movie. It's what he considered to be his best movie. It's a huge cult classic. It's referenced in like a lot, just so many things. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's definitely one of the ones that I think of first when I think of Harryhausen. And I know a lot of film, other film buffs do as well. It is really really interesting the other thing to note that might have affected the box office flop is that this is the first harry hausen movie to actually receive a booking in theaters most of his movies received That's the, the B letter block booking. a not yeah, just the letter a, a not just any not booking. just a booking not singular the letter a yeah because and i'm sure we talked about this before but movies were typically sold in packages up to a certain point in film history and uh they're typically they're often sold as double features with the first movie uh, being the the A movie being the big one that was going to make a lot of money, and then the B movie being tied to it as well, which wasn't as profitable, but it was sold in the package to make it more profitable, and it was often not as serious a fare, and it typically featured a lot of genre pictures and a lot of noir pictures, um, uh, a lot of monster movies and stuff like that would be B movies, and up until this point. Um, all of Harryhausen's work had been B-movies. That's where he kind of made his name, especially working at Columbia with uh, with the producer Schneer. But uh, at this point, he moved to A-booking, uh, which he honestly, he probably deserved. Unfortunately, at the time, it just wasn't wasn't good timing for that. 
which is kind of a bummer, um, especially because this one's remembered so fondly and uh, and definitely one of the ones that inspired so much future work, especially stuff, uh, big adventure movies like the Indiana Jones series. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and this one has some really cool set pieces in it, like the uh, um, the one with the bronze statue is really cool because that the the bronze i think adds a whole other element to it that like a uh, a kind of flesh creature is a little different and especially like when you're talking this kind of effects because like we could kind of put you know a person in in like a um in a monster suit or whatever which had been done a lot but the bronze statue doesn't work as well with like a person in a costume so doing it in this kind of way you kind of get the sense of that kind of statue coming to life um and uh yeah let's see what are the other set pieces of this one the harpies are kind of interesting but this one is again it's it's sort of we get on a boat and we go through an adventure and then we go to another adventure um and we have the hydra which is a variation on the dragon um and stuff like that and then of course the uh the skeletons at the end. Oh man, the skeletons are iconic. Classic, yeah. They're so cool. Everyone knows them too. Like the little claymated skeletons. Oh, they're so cool. And again, this one is structured off of the basis of the myth. So I don't really remember too much of the story still, but we're given just enough motivation at the start of it for it to work. We know he's the yeah. man with one sandal. He gets sent off on a quest and he has to complete it. And so he goes through a series of challenges you know, classic hero's journey stuff. Again, very good structure for a story. But I, you don't focus on the story too much. We don't focus on Jason's inner turmoil too much because we have to save time for these monsters. And so we just spend a lot of time on the monsters. And then we can only cut of, back to the story when we need to. It's a little interesting that that is still the case and, and it gets a booking. And I kind of wonder if that's sort of because it's... I think that contributed to... Harryhausen... Because it's, yeah, it's still the same kind of thing, right? I mean, the the weight of the story kind of comes down to Jason. I would like, like kind of ostensibly um, defying the gods by just refusing their help. But then he still takes their help as often as he needs it. And so it sort of undercuts its own themes if it's trying to be like, a thematic movie um, yeah if you focus on it too much it doesn't make sense right but that's the point it's like if you're gonna sell it as an a movie like it should make sense and not yeah. just I think that's for part the of monster what release <laughs> right yeah yeah um, um but yeah it's it's exactly what it needs to be to to survive or, or to 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 focus on to be such a fun movie and such a good cult classic yeah. um also just like to compare the skeleton fight alone took four months to animate and composite. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Compared to the 11 months in, in uh, for the entirety of the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad to animate all of that movie. So his is, uh, and that just goes to show that the level of intricacy and involvement that Harry Harryhausen puts into his work continues to develop over the course of his career. Um, yeah. And gets more and more detailed here as well. I think maybe maybe the last thing to say about this one is that there's a little bit and I don't remember if there was in the seventh voyage, but we were starting to get some animatronics mixed in here, too, with the. Uh, oh, um, Bubo. Well, no, not. No, well, Bubo's the next movie. Never. Mind. Yeah, Bubo's the next movie, which is definitely going to require some. We're going to talk about Bubo. About. <laughs> but we're here talk we about have Bubo. Um, we have uh, the head of. Um, uh, Hera or wh whichever goddess was like guiding him and her eyes like open and close. And uh, I think they oh, have yeah, the big wooden statue head. Oh, I think in the next one they, they do the, the superimposing the face on the statue, like the annoying orange. But in this one, you kind of yes. get, you kind <laughs> of get the eyes opening and stuff as she's, as the statue quote unquote is talking with Jason. So now we've got, we've got the classic dynamation or, uh, whatever the other version of that is. Um, we've got the compositing and we've got animatronics. So yeah, again, he's like, it's, it's almost sad the way that like Harry Housen is ramping up steam as the rest of the world is kind of passing him by. He's like, he's nailed this one 
thing and then the next thing comes and passes him up uh but he was he was in peak form at this point well the thing is too that his his development of these techniques is in large part what led to the development of the techniques that would make him obsolete right like we've been so, alluding to all of these techniques are still the way that we make movies um and even if we're talking things like like some of the films which are getting rarer and rarer that still will incorporate um, live action footage like Lord of the Rings would do bigatures and miniatures and in addition to computer generated effects. But a lot of the ways that you incorporate all of those things is still essentially the same. It's just a matter of are you filming the frame by frame or are you basically building one of your layers on the computer and adding that in? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you recording, are you making that uh, footage with a camera or in a program? Right. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. But yeah, this one is a classic. And again, yeah, if you haven't checked this out, go check it out. If you don't check out any of the other movies from today, I highly recommend this you is check a good this one. one out. This is, I found this is it the one online in good quality, so not... It should be out there. It's, it's in a lot of wink, places. Wink, wink. Yeah, nudge, nudge. Um, but alas, let's move on to Clash of the Titans from 1981. Jason, take it away. Clash of the Titans from 1981. After a prophecy gone tragically wrong, Zeus's demigod son, Perseus, is set to sea in a wooden chest while the terrible Kraken tears apart the kingdom of Perseus' birth. Now as a grown man, Perseus is transported away to an adventure jam-packed with danger. A treacherous satyr with a chip on his shoulder wants Perseus dead. And Perseus wants to win the hand of the satyr's ex fiance by completing a quest that involves cutting off a Gorgon's head and showing down with a giant sea monster. All right, Jonathan. So this is the one that... Uh, this is going to be fun. Know, loses... It has, so we've been talking so far about how the the story is kind of backseated into the supporting yeah. role. And so far up to this point, the story really has performed that role well. But and it hasn't Titans, mattered because it hasn't tried to supplant yeah. the rest. Yeah. And so this is this is kind of the story of what happened with Clash of the Titans and kind of where this becomes a problem. So Clash of the Titans from 1981 came after a string of very successful Sinbad movies and producer, he, uh, Carrie House. Unfortunately, it also came obtained, after a string of very successful Star Wars movies. It did. <laughs> um, and we will get to that. But Harry Housen at this point had had a, all those movies had been a release movies after Jason, they had all been successful. So he was riding high and Harry Housen, uh, was going to make another movie. And, uh, after, you know, there are a few things happening in the blockbuster world at this moment. One, the blockbuster world came to be. Two, the blockbuster world started to attract very popular actors um, or make actors very popular by being in a blockbuster movie. And one of the things that happened with Clash of the Titans is that the producer seeing this wanted this movie to have a higher production quality, not only in its effects department, but also in its acting presence. So it hired a bunch of very big actors. Uh, for all the like, roles except the lead. For all the roles except the lead, which is really funny. Um, but, you know, I mean, we read that, we, we read that list at the top of the, uh, at the top of the podcast. We were int introing the movies. Burgess Meredith is in this. Lawrence Olivier is in yep. this. Um, Maggie Smith is in this. Like, big names a lot of british names uh, a lot of big names in acting especially stage acting are here in this movie which lent a lot of weight to the gods of olympus who they mostly play and it's very impressive um but it also means that that balance that you had before in the previous movies where the story was backseated and the acting was backseated to the cgi doesn't exist in this movie so they kind of have this battle between the story, which is trying to take a bigger role, and the story itself, not really up to snuff. It's not a bad story, but it's not a story that's good enough to be yeah. like, the main highlight of a movie. And it, it's battling against these, the, this claymation and composite VFX, which is Harryhausen's like, highest quality of work. Right. Like it, best technology at his disposal so far. 
uh, most experienced at his disposal so far. He whips out Bubo, which we'll talk about more in detail. Um, and it's just, it's very impressive. And you kind of have a clash of what the focus of this movie is going to be. Are we focusing on the monsters or are we focusing on um, the story? And instead of finding a balance, you just have kind of like this competition between the two. And it almost feels like you're watching like this one drama at some times versus these other times where you're watching uh, a big monster movie. And it doesn't integrate as smoothly as the other movies because of that loss of balance. And the other thing, which we're going to have to talk about in depth, is the fact that at this point, Star Wars 1977 and Superman 1978 had come out, which were both yeah. big computer graphics movies. And this movie also released on the also same day big that Raiders movies. of the Lost Ark came out. Another giant uh, Spielberg movie and another giant computer graphics movie. And Claymation just looked old. Also... Like I mentioned before, the tagline for Raiders of the Lost Ark is the return of the great adventure. And so it's like blockbuster cinema, American New Wave is saying, look, we're bringing back the old classics that you loved better than ever. Meanwhile, the people who made the old classics are still trying to make the old classics exactly the same as they were um, yeah. at the same time. It's like this really weird overlap. And this yeah. this movie does feel like it's stuck in the middle of a lot of stuff because when you're watching it, it's sword and sandal, but you're thinking star Wars because star Wars is based on sword and sandal type, uh, samurai films and Westerns and stuff like that. Um, but it feels more integrated all the way through than this movie does. And even, and this is something that's really interesting to me is I feel like the, I, I don't know where exactly the disconnect is. I think that um, I feel like Harry Hamlin kind of drops the ball in terms of he doesn't carry the film very well. Uh, he has very little expression and I don't know. I don't know where that like, I, I don't know. For some reason, there's there's a difference between stoicism and whatever Harry Hamlin is doing in this movie that I don't think kind of works. Um, he does it. He just can't. I don't think he can measure up to some of the other actors. Right. I mean, you've got Har like you said, you've got Harrison Ford coming out and doing his greatest stuff around the same time. And he's just not a Harrison Ford. Um, no, it's not the same kind of charisma. And, and and blockbusters were coming along and saying that, hey, we can have this kind of charismatic actor in a B movie. But uh, yeah, that wasn't that what wasn't required in Jason was suddenly required by the time Clash of the Titans came up and uh, Hamlin did not meet the brief, I don't think. But I think the other thing is there is there is a place for films that can be carried by a certain stylisticness, but the other elements have to work together. So I was thinking Labyrinth comes out four, five years after this movie, okay? And Labyrinth is like, almost silly almost over the top but it's so stylized you have jim henson like it's not computer graphics it's all jim henson's real world um uh, puppeteers uh sorry puppeteers yes puppeteers um but you have david Bowie's charisma i mean the story is kind of wacky and wild but it kind of all works in this way that it just feels like it works together and then I just don't know what the difference is with Clash of the Titans, which has some really intricate, like I was telling Alex, like I, I feel like Harryhausen is almost the, the stop motion version of, um, of, uh, Jim Henson in terms of the creativity of his designs and the, and the, uh, the way that his characters integrate, but there's something lacking in the, in the melding of those elements and the story and in this film, I feel like some of the acting and stuff. Yeah. And there's just there's something that the doesn't connect off. all those different elements together in this movie. And then it just it feels tonally strange at points. Yeah. And you have Bubo that does feel like he's straight out of Star Wars in a sword and sandal film. Um, yeah. And it's just yeah. there, it just it doesn't all hit home the way that it could have. The, uh, the success of some of those earlier movies came from their ability to only focus on 
certain things at a time, and this one tries to focus on too many things. It tries to be a good acting movie, a good story movie, and a good effects movie, and it can't really. Yeah. It, it, it in in that process it founders. Uh, <laughs> there are some of these. Li- there's a there's a line um, where uh, what's her face the uh, the princess is saying um because he's he's asking if she if she loved um oh my gosh i'm losing all the greek names right now the uh the monster guy calibus he's asking did did you love him and she's like no it was never love uh he was he was interesting and i was smitten with him and and then he's like i saw you once and he was he was interesting and handsome and then he says i saw you once and i knew that i loved you i'm like you just said the same thing that she said about the way she felt about him that wasn't love but it's love for you like they did the script is lacking to the say thing the, is, the 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 script wouldn't have to make sense if this movie was made with the same balance that like jason or sinbad right. was made but it, it it is and uh that's kind of it's kind of a shame um in a lot of ways the funny uh, thing is they remade this movie uh like they did 40 years Maybe later years and it did it it felt exactly the same just with it computer did. graphics just with computer graphics and a very different kraken yeah actually the kraken in this movie looks like the um uh the emir from 20 million miles to earth i think it was i think it was repurposed again yeah I think I think uh, Harry Housen just had one big humanoid model and just put different stuff on it. Yeah, to, to make different big monsters. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this is this is another thing that happened with Bubo, which uh, you mentioned before. He's this whirly, clickly, clicky metal owl um, that Athena sends in place of her actual flesh and blood owl um, to assist Perseus in his journeys, and. Uh, Bo- Ray Harryhausen swears up and down that Booba was created prior to the release of Star Wars There's and no R2-D2, way. which is the, which bears a lot of resemblance to Booba in the way the head spins and whirs and clicks and talks and beeps. Um, and the fact and that he's the comic relief. Like, he does the all the same things. Relief. He gets knocked around yeah. and, like, pops back up and boop, 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 and then saves the day. Well, Booba is, like, if R2-D2 and... Um, C-3PO were like joined into one character kind of. Yeah, that's true. And that was a um, bird. And it was a bird. Um, but yeah, he swears up and down that it wasn't the same, but it was so similar that people, and it came out like, you know, four years after Star Wars. So people were like, oh, hey, it's just R2-D2 all over again. Um, which is another thing that happened. The timeline with which you could make movies had changed. Um, as we've been talking about, it takes a while to make these claymation movies doesn't take as long to make a, a CGI movie, a computer yeah. graphics based movie. So, and this you know, movie has so many set pieces movie. in it. So many. And again, it's kind of a shame because a lot of the animation in this movie is amazing and really, really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the compositing is really, really cool and seamless, but it just doesn't, it, it doesn't measure up to a lot of the fare that's, uh, so in, from a contemporary perspective, it doesn't measure up to the, the the fare of the day. And from a historical perspective, what we're looking at it from, it feels unbalanced. So on both fronts, it's a little disappointing. Um, I think it's worth a look at just to see the uh, development of uh, something like this versus Raiders of the Lost Ark, especially considering those two are contemporary, which is crazy to think about. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting... Uh, it's an interesting uh, mishmash to see in an off kilter balance. And after this, um, Harry Housen didn't make another feature movie. I don't believe. I believe this was his last feature. Oh, okay, interesting. The other element of the story, I think that yeah, I think this is another thing. Is that the yes, that was his last uh, feature film. Oh, okay, but I f- I feel like you end up feeling a disconnect between. Like Calibus is almost more of a pitiful character than a villain because he's literally just rejected. He's like the it's like the anti Beauty and the Beast. Like he becomes the Beast, and she's so repulsed by him that she rejects him for a handsome hero, and then he takes revenge. But you really can't blame him, honestly. And then we're supposed to we're supposed to feel like all elated when the hero 
defeats Calibus, but it's like, okay, he just like had life kicked him in the face, and Zeus is so un uh sympathetic because he's just so selfish and the characters all point that out but he's still like we're still supposed to be rooting for him and his son uh yeah the sympathies don't line up i guess yeah. the point is that calibus is supposed to be a bit of a uh jackass before the movie even starts but the problem is that it's only ever mentioned yeah we don't see that it's not really seen you know if we saw calibus being a terrible person because i think the, the movie, thing was he killed all the all the all the uh all the winged horses and yeah, Pegasus he was the only all the one Pegasi left. before uh, before the movie started. Apparently, among other crimes, but again, again, they we only mention that and like in one scene briefly. They don't really show it. So if we had seen him be super cruel at the start, I think we could have. I think we could have. You know, I think the audience would have felt it more. Yeah, <laughs> at least with Darth Vader, we see him choke a guy like pretty early on. Yeah, exactly. All right, Jonathan. Shall we slide into overall notes? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So the first thing we have to talk about is style um, and essentially what claymation has become. Because uh, Harryhausen, he, while he didn't pioneer claymation, I think he made it super, super, super popular. You know, yeah. his movies were like the signature claymation movies of like a whole era of filmmaking. They still uh, are the signature because they've kind of been frozen yeah. in time because people don't, I mean, when it's done, it's here and there for a certain yeah. effect. But I mean, he, yeah, he's still the pinnacle of claymation because after him, there's no more. Yeah, and that's that's the that's the transition that stop motion itself has undergone. Uh, it started off as like a way to accomplish VFX compositing, and then as VFX comedy, compositing developed beyond it, stop motion wound up sticking around, kind of as its own style, and it is really really cool. And this is my one chance to, uh, or I think I've dropped it before, but I'll mention it again. But the first movie I ever made, ever made, Jonathan. You know what it was? It was in PowerPoint. It was it was a claymated movie, uh, oh, okay. in 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 the fourth grade, in uh, GT class, our special gifted and talented side class that happened during the day. Um, we made a CGI movie of Balto the Sled Dog. Uh, nice as he as he carried the, the medicine to the kids or whatever happened and this is a lost movie by the way I no longer have any copies of it which is sad uh, but i'll have to forgive my nine-year-old self for not being great at archiving um but i do remember that the bear model we used because the dogs were attacked by a bear at some point during the uh, clay made a movie uh, the bear model we used fell apart and so we had the uh the credit scene be the characters playing barehead volleyball while uh, the credits rolled over oh, the top of that. Oh, of course, naturally. Yeah. One day I'm going to have to remake that just to, so it exists. <laughs> That's awesome. It was definitely not animated as well as any of these. Uh, but we should also mention how influential uh, Harryhausen's work is. I mean, it should be pretty obvious, but you know everybody, Spielberg, Peter Jackson, Joe Dante, Tim Burton... James Cameron, Guillermo del Toro, George Lucas, like just everybody has been influenced by this by in some way, shape, or form. And especially considering the extent and the prevalence to which composite graphics have become uh, like a part of almost every movie, um, even movies where you wouldn't expect composite graphics to be a part of it, uh, you can consider Ray Harryhausen to have touched all of those movies or influence them in some way, shape or form, whether it be like the fact that they include a monster or the fact that they just include one of the many effects that he pioneered with his dynamation techniques. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like the way that you do those kind of things is still, <laughs> it's still around. I mean, you have to think through those shots in a certain way. Like even going back to mighty Joe young, there's a shot at the very beginning where, uh, Joe young is standing on a cliff and he reaches down and picks up one of the cowboys and the cowboy is like swinging by his arm, which is, I mean, just thinking about the way that you have to coordinate that so that you can film the cowboy swinging and then connect up the hands with the ape and do all, like all that stuff is still the same kind of things that you have to think through today. And uh, I mean, he's super influential in making making the way that we do effects as efficient as it is. Um, because now we do have it down to almost more of a science than an art. 
which is kind of sad to say. But like we're saying, like the way that he did graphics was very much a matter of feel and understanding. And, you know, people, you don't have to have a degree in anatomy to get into visual effects these days, but you really have to understand anatomy to do effects the way that he did effects. Um, and it definitely helps today, but the process has become so uh, mechanized that you can really... A very assembly line. Too. Yeah, you yeah. can use, you know, models and stuff like that. And some of this is is great for certain applications, you know, like the way that Weta Digital created this... Um, uh, they created their massive program, which lets you basically automate two armies fighting together for some of the scenes in Lord of the Rings. But it's like you just click a button and you have armies fighting in, in, in different ways every time you click the button, um, as opposed to like, let's figure out how we have to make this uh, Hydra move all of its different heads so that it looks as dangerous as possible. Um, nowadays, it's <laughs> like you're saying, you just use some kind of, um, you know, yeah. walk cycle that you can just apply to all the different heads and put a randomized button on it and, and that kind of thing. Uh, Less less individual choices being made, which is great for speed, right? But it can take a lot of the heart out of it and a lot of the um, specificity out of that. You know, having having a computer make all those decisions for you can be important, but it can also be tempting to skip over those important decisions when one or two tweaks here, one or two tweaks two tweaks there might make all the difference. But I think yeah, and I think the cool thing is that now the the people who would try to use this effect are the people who would be thinking through their films more intentionally like that and so hopefully like the ways that dynamation and it's a little bit different but like you know even the way that anderson has been doing stop motion for entire films but if you were going to use this type of animation it would be hopefully in the in the service of stories that have a little more weight to them than the types of projects that Harryhausen usually got to work on. Um, mm -hmm. because otherwise you just do it the cheap and fast way, which is not Harryhausen's way. Harryhausen's way used to be the only way. And now it's, it's the way of people who are really trying to think through what they want their film to look like. And it's going to have a specific style, but they're also, hopefully thinking through all the other parts of their film as well. Yeah. And that's kind of the irony of it too, is we talked about before how during the blockbuster era, B movies went from something that weren't, wasn't taken seriously to something that could be taken seriously. And that's very much the space that we exist in now where genre movies and TV shows can be taken very seriously and frequently are, um, to almost an intense degree by some people. Um, and a lot of that is due to Harryhausen's work and making them so appealing that people who wanted to tell good stories also wanted to work in his uh, in his creative space of this genre as well, um, sci-fi and fantasy genres. Um, but it and it is horribly ironic that the fact that he uh, inspired those people to do that thing and make the leap into CGI and make blockbusters be taken seriously. It is the same movement that uh, caused his like final film, uh, Clash of the Titans, to not do as well, um, or so to be a bit more of a mess. That's that's almost it's almost it's the way that it, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like it, it's almost the way that it has to be, but it's also so sad that to be that specialized means that by the time you get surpassed, it's almost too late for you to make the switch into the thing that surpassed you, but you're still the one that created the thing that surpassed you. And yeah. so at that point, and you just have to kind of accept it and watch it. Like now I want a, a Ray Harryhausen biopic with like a really deep, <laughs> deep message in it. Well, we're getting a weird Al one. So maybe you'll get your Ray Harryhausen one. Um, Can Daniel Radcliffe and the other play thing Ray too Harryhausen? Is I think, <laughs> I think that if you... If you are the sort of craftsman who is dedicated to the advancement of your technique, like Harryhausen was, as much as it is, I is like tragically ironic to us. I don't think that if I were in Harryhausen's shoes, that I'd be mad about it. Right. Like what you'd want, what you'd hope for, 
is that the people who come after you would take your techniques and run with them and carry them further than you were able to in your time. Because that's how techniques are supposed to develop and hopefully technology is supposed to develop as well. So if you're devoted to the idea of, of VFX, like Harryhausen seems to be, um, then hope, you would hope that people would be able to take it further than you. And they, they certainly have developed many technologies, technologies beyond that. So, you know, I don't think from a personal perspective, and of course we don't have his, his words on this at our hands. Maybe they exist out there. I bet they exist in one of his books. Right. Um, but uh, we, we don't know specifically what he thought about it. But I personally, you know, if I was a VFX guy, I'd be thrilled that people took my techniques and ran with them and that I was able to inspire so much of the world. And it's weird because we talk about people and their influence, but I really don't know if we've talked about anybody whose work has such a fundamental impact on almost yeah. all of cinema as Harry Hausen does. Like VFX are so common. They're in everything. And he developed so much of the modern technique, the modern fundamentals that go into CGI and composite or at least graphics. Did so much to push them in that direction, even if yeah, he didn't create the techniques, but he he mastered them and he I mean, furthered computer, them. Computer computer graphics are based on techniques that he developed. Yeah. Like dynamation, like cutting things into layers, compositing them into a single image, using the same lighting to accomplish the thing, lighting things in certain ways to achieve a more uh, effective composite final image, all comes from his dynamation work and went into computer graphics, and that still exists now. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. And I, I mean, like it literally touches almost every TV show, almost every movie. And it's it's truly wild how much of an impact that has on everything. Maybe more so than any of the directors we've talked about on on the show, like ever. Like yeah. that's that's saying something too. So it's kind of mind boggling how much it, it impact this guy has. Boop, 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 boop. Breaking news, Alex. Uh, uh -huh. So in 2021. Last year, as of the recording of this, uh, it was announced that the Ray Harryhausen Award would be launched to celebrate his influence on filmmakers and animators. And they oh, had there you go. the first uh, ceremony of it um, this year in June of 2022, oh, which was uh, his 102nd. This this year marks his 102nd, 102nd, uh, 102nd birthday. birthday. And uh, the movie Mad God, which I haven't heard of. Um, won the first award for that. So again, Mad his legacy God. his legacy continues. And like we've said before, and the reason that we don't mention the award show that shall not be mentioned is that to find the the awards where they truly belong, like where each individual award is given to the the film that did the best at that, not just the most of that, which the award show that shall not be named usually awards, uh, is to go to those those foundations, those um, uh, those organizations awards. And so like the films that win the Ray, uh, the Ray Harryhausen awards are films that are actually doing good visual effects and not just the like the ones that are doing technically masterful visual effects, and not just the ones that are doing the most or the big, biggest visual effects and also are going to get the most name recognition to promote the ceremony. Um, so the fact that we haven't heard of Mad God probably means that eh, maybe the story was lacking, but I oh. bet it has some amazing visual effects. Oh, it's done by it's directed by Phil Tippett. Yes, who he he is one of the giant uh, oh. one of the most one of the most influential like visual effects supervisors ever of the CGI era, and he did a lot of work at ILM and DreamWorks, including yeah. he did a lot of work on Star Wars, Jurassic Park. RoboCop. So that's really, really cool. That's really, really cool. He's kind of, in a lot of ways, although not as famous, you could probably consider him to be a Ray Harryhausen of the computer era in the mm -hmm. amount of work he's done. Um, and actually, this project, Mad God, was funded on Kickstarter for distribution oh, through go. Shutter. The fact that it was distributed through Shutter is probably why we never heard of it. Right. But I'm glad you brought that up because it's going on my watch list. There you go. It looks absolutely absurd. Actually, Phil Tippett was the guy who had uh, that really 
<laughs> a quote that spoke to my soul because I do a lot of VFX pools every day for work. Um, where he was talking about how uh, when he was working on Star Wars and RoboCop, they would sit down at a scene, and when they talked about VFX, they would talk about how they could make the scene cooler or better. And nowadays, when he when he's in uh, some of these other VFX rooms, uh, when he hears about them, people are talking about how they can fix it instead of how they can make it better. Oh, gosh. Um, and so it's looking because it often feels like VFX get used that way, especially in TV, maybe less so in movies. I feel like it's used more frequently like this in television where VFX are used as like a QC element, like a corrective element right. at the end of the process instead of like this Harryhausen or this Tippet esque element where um, they're used to uh, to enhance. Yeah. You know? Films aren't they're allowed to-, to have blemishes anymore, Alex. No. Oh, man. It's, it's just, oh. It's it's frustrating. There's a uh, there's a quote. There's too much polish. There's a quote in in photography that uh, I think was Henry Cartier Bresson, who was a uh, a street photographer. Um, but the he said at some point, um, sharpness is a bourgeois concept, and in photography, sharpness is like the ultimate. You know, getting everything right in focus, perfectly visible. Um, but from a classic film photographer and a street photographer when you're literally walking around you're trying to capture a moment as it happens that has the most visual impact so like sharpness is hard to come by because you're throwing up your camera really quickly you don't have that much time between getting the moment right and getting your your focus or keeping your hand steady um and so it's about the impact it's not about the technical perfection and i think that kind of applies here too it's like film's are now just kind of so polished and sharp that they've lost some of the magic of the reason that we make films in the first place. Yeah. There's, there's something so warm about a less perfect film. And I, I, you know what it goes back to? One of the big things we've been talking about today is this balance of what you want to emphasize in your movie. And we've been talking about the fun of these monsters versus the emphasis on story. But another thing that can be emphasized is polish and technical perfection. Yeah. And there are some movies where that makes sense to focus on. But it's become a thing where everybody wants to focus on having the most technically perfect thing that could ever exist and must fix all mistakes. And it has to be exactly perfect or as right as it can be in the budget under time. And there goes all the time to focus on all the other. Or it's not worthy of being released. Yeah. Yeah. And then there goes all the time and effort and focus that's spent on everything else. And I think we have become like a little too technology obsessed. And I kind of get it because these technologies are sold to us based on how polished they can make your your recording or your photo yeah. or your audio, right? But that's not the, the, the fidelity or the resolution or the depth is not the only reason that we make we re- shoot a photograph or record audio or shoot a film. There are so many other reasons that we shoot for things. And typically visual fidelity or quality is like low on the list. Like when it comes, I remember studying editing in college and when we had like a list that we were given of reasons to to make a cut and low down on the list were like visual continuity or quality of shot and high up on the list were story or emotion yeah. or uh, or pacing. You know, stuff that impacts the reception of the story. You know, it's. it's I'm actually amazed watching old films how many times they use jump cuts and it just, you don't even think about it. But now, if you use a jump cut that's not covered by something, it's like, whoa, you screwed up. Yeah, yeah. You know, technique, it's good to perfect your technique, but it's also crazy to to expect a movie to be completely, completely polished. Like nothing's perfect and that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Sometimes art There's, is better when you can see the fingerprints on it. Like literally in the case of Frey Harryhausen. Yeah. There is, um, there's this, ah, oh gosh, I re- wish I remember the name of it, but there's this Japanese concept that the most beautiful things are those with imperfections. Mm. And it's, I feel like that's, that's really, really true. It's, it's like the art of weird. pouring, pouring gold into broken um, like vessels and vases and stuff. That exactly comes from it. And I think the same thing, I mean, it's kind of, I think a fundamental truth about reality because there really isn't anything that's perfect in reality because perfect is like a fabricated construct made up by man 
we can't, we can't not be perfect as people. Mm-hmm. That is impossible. We are imperfect people. We are flawed. That, that isn't it's like, how humans it's, work. It's like the concept of infinity. Like we know that numbers go up. And so technically you just keep going up forever and you, that's infinity. And that's the same thing with perfection. Like we know things can get better. And so technically they can get better forever. And then that's like perfect, but there's no way to actually get to there's perfect. No stop. Perfect is yeah. the same distance as infinity is. <laughs> there's no end. And it's crazy too, because I do think we've hit a point with digital technology that's good enough. <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of people wouldn't agree with me, but like we don't need more FPS for a movie to look better. Yeah. We don't need more resolution for a movie to look better. We're we're good. Maybe I mean even like when it comes to like HDR, like HDR looks to me at this point having looked at so much color and color work, HDR just looks different. It yeah. doesn't look better, it just looks <laughs> right. different. So it's like it's like at you the know. same at the same time that numbers technically go up to infinity. At some point, you have to stop counting. Like you can't yeah. count forever. <laughs> we don't we don't need we don't need more we don't need more Ks. Stop giving me more Ks. We don't have enough storage space for all these Ks. Yeah, where are we going to put them? We need to put oh more rods and cones in our eyes for more Ks. Yeah, our eyes. Uh, <laughs> we've we've passed the point. We've definitely passed the point where humans can really perceive it. And I say that like and it there, ever always, mattered ever. Yeah. There's always going to be someone out there like, I can tell the difference between 8K and 9K with my retinas. Um, But no, you can't. Calm down. Calm down. I don't know. Maybe that's just an underlying fact of like humanness is that we strive for perfection but can never be it. But it definitely seems to be a thing that's gotten maybe a little out of hand in the uh, digital world and the world of media making, especially visual storytelling. And maybe we all need to breathe out and just focus on, focus. you know, if all we have is clay, maybe we just need to focus on being good with the clay. Yeah. Maybe we don't need a giant animation program to make it happen. That's yeah. where I'm going to leave it for now. Exactly. I have some further reasoning to suggest unless you have anything else you want to add. No, let's see where we can hear more about Ray Harryhausen from his own mouth. From his own mouth and his buddy's mouth, Tony Dalton. Um, And then one book who I forgot to look up the author of. Uh, Film Fantasy Scrapbook was Ray Harryhausen's first book. Um, And it again, it's kind of told in that Jim Henson-esque style where it's all very visually uh, based. Then there's From the Land Beyond, Beyond the Making of the Movie Monsters You've Known and Loved, the films of Willis O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen. Jonathan, I heard clicky clacks. Are you looking it up? By Jeff Robin. By Jeff Robin. Then Ray Harryhausen, an animated life told by or written by Ray Harryhausen's buddy, Tony Dalton. Then The Art of Ray Harryhausen, again, written by Tony Dalton. And then a couple teamwork books, A Century of Model Animation by Harryhausen and Dalton. And then Ray Harryhausen's Fantasy Scrapbook, again, again by Harryhausen and Dalton. So lots of stuff to explore out there. If you, like us, are enamored with Harryhausen's work and just need to experience more of it, highly recommend it and go watch these movies as well. They're worthwhile. And also, you know, take a look in the mirror and breathe and don't (laughs) worry so much about being perfect. You know, you don't need to stress yourself out like that. But wait, a new contender has entered the ring. ILM. (laughs) Stay tuned. Just Just beat you up. Uh, so someday we'll we'll cover ILM, I'm sure. And, and then a uh, beta weta. And then yeah, ILM versus weta will be like a whole thing. ILM versus weta is probably just is the episode and we'll just do four movies, two ILM, two weta. That would and be then great. Just, and and then, then we uh, can use it there there'll be two structures to it. It'll be verses so we can compare and contrast and then it'll be a timeline. To, to kind of track the development of major technologies. And we'll probably want to pick movies along those points where we introduce new or very interesting technologies into the workflow. And that episode will come out uh, as soon as Disney buys Weta. Yes. <laughs> oh, gosh, I hope they don't. It's so but they, sad, they but they it's might. also very, very possible. It's very possible. Anyway, what are we talking about next time on the podcast, Jonathan? Yeah, so next time on the podcast, we're actually taking a break. So next month, we're on hiatus. I am having a baby, so I'm going to be very sleep-deprived and uh, will not be able to keep up 
um, with the show for a little bit. But do not fear, we still have content for you guys. Uh, we recorded uh, a few years ago now some commentaries on the Lord of the Rings films, which we thought might be appropriate to release here on the main show. Um, we had recorded them for the bonus podcast in the past, but we'll release them here through the main channel for you guys. Uh, Alex and I banter about uh, techniques in the films, about uh, some of the lore. So even if you're not sitting down watching, these are for the extended versions, by the way. But even if you're not sitting down and listening to the commentary with the films running, there should be enough running commentary to uh, kind of keep up with as a podcast. Um, yeah, we ran the whole time we did that that commentary. Yeah, we ran. We ran so much. It was a long run. Um but yeah, it's kind run. of appropriate with the uh, with the release of the Rings of Power show on uh, Amazon Prime, which we uh, have talked about. We just talked about in an upcoming episode <laughs> of the bonus podcast. Um, if you'd like to support us, though, we do have the Patreon. We have the bonus podcast. We have the discord. Um, the last episode of the Patreon podcast, which is out right now for you to listen to, uh, covers The Lost World, which is one of Willis O'Brien's big films uh, that we talked, we mentioned before. Lots of dinosaur effects, lots of inspiration for Ray Harryhausen. So if you want to hear more about the history of um, of this animation style, this the, the beginnings of Dynamation, go check out the episode on Lost World and stay tuned on the bonus podcast for our thoughts on The Rings of Power. And stay tuned on the main show for our thoughts on The Lord of the Rings. Exactly. Well, that's about all the time we have for this episode. To find links to things that we talked about today, as well as a complete list of past episodes and all 441 films we've covered so far, visit thefilmlinks.com. You can also join us for ongoing film discussions on our Discord server. And to stay posted about upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at thefilmlinks. Summaries for each of the films this episode were recorded by me, Jason Harden. You can find me on Twitter at the Blue Jay 1994. If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. Really good setup for um for. Arabian nights, like Arabian days. All right, we don't want to copyright tag. Um... <laughs>